Hey there, and welcome to episode number 30, 30 of season two of the World of Presentations podcast brought to you by us at Presentation Agency 356 Labs. I'm Boris, the founder of the company and your host for this episode. And today we are actually talking to a colleague of ours from the industry. His name is Simon Morton and Simon runs a presentation agency obviously, called IFO Presentations. What's more, uh, he is also the author of the book, The Presentation Lab. And uh, Simon, you're one of the speakers at the upcoming Present to Succeed conference that we're hosting in April. So Simon, welcome to the podcast. Super happy we're finally doing this. <laughs> so <laughs> let's start with you filling in kind of the details that I missed to mention in your introduction. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, first of all, it's tremendous to be here uh really looking forward to the conference in april but before we get to that uh yeah let me explain a little bit about us and where we come from and what have you so eiffel presentations has been around for about 16 years now um like many of us in in our sector it was uh started in my back bedroom many many years ago uh as a one-man army trying to improve quality of presentations in the uk uh, i started off life as uh, somebody that thought they were good at design and um and that was very quickly uh, that idea was very quickly sort of uh, uh sort of vanquished because uh, as we got busy i found myself spending more and more time talking to our clients about their story and their message and getting more excited about that and ending up actually outsourcing sourcing the design to uh some uh, some colleagues uh, that I knew. And when their design came back, I realized I really should never touch PowerPoint myself again because those guys were so much better at it. Okay. But maybe there was a way of us combining the consultancy approach that we took with great design. And that's really when things took off. So um, fast forward 16 years uh, and there are just about 40 of us now, uh, all based in the UK. Um, we work with companies large and small, so some of the big, you know, sort of global brands. We're very fortunate to, to be sort of you know, their presentation agency and work very closely with them. Um, but as you know, you can work with those huge businesses one day and the next day you'd start working with a startup. And they're just as challenging, just as important and, uh, and just as in need of, of a great presentation. So, uh, so that's us. And, and like you say, very kindly, the, uh, uh, we had a book published about five years ago now, maybe six years ago, the time has flown, um, called the Presentation Lab book. That's been translated into five different languages now, I think. Um, and is a good sort of, uh, it was a good process to go through because if you ever get the opportunity, and I'm sure you will, Boris, when somebody says, you've got to write a book, and I know Alexi, for example, another one of the speakers uh, presents to succeed as, as an author in our sector, it's the best way of you taking all of the ideas and all of the experience that you have and, and codifying it. Because yeah. it, a lot of what we do, you naturally do because you're that type of person. A book forces you to kind of create the the code and and break down the process that you would naturally do and that's uh, that's been a really interesting process yeah so can where can people find the book by the way is it on amazon or is it only on your website oh no amazon barnes and noble anyway. yeah booksellers of repute is what we say so uh, <laughs> uh and yeah it's available like i say in i'm looking at my my uh uh, my bookshelf here is really interesting. There's a Korean version of it and a Chinese version of it. Wow. And I have absolutely no way of knowing what the translation says because wow. everything I've written has just been translated directly into those languages. So even the dedication to my wife and kids at the front has been translated. So all I've been able to say to my kids is, look, that's your name in Chinese. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious to come back to the book, by the way because there are some reasons. Uh, okay. Let's just <laughs> leave it there. Uh, we are working on something that's very close to it, I would say. Oh, cool. So I can come out. If we have the time, I'll come back to that one because I have some questions. And I think that people who are going to listen to this one would be curious to know some behind the scenes 
of writing and publishing a book are is the book with the publisher or yes. you self published? Yeah, yeah, it was with uh, uh, with Wiley. So oh, okay. Publisher. So these are these. Are, this is a big publisher. Yeah, they, 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 these guys are players. <laughs> yeah, exactly. These guys are definitely players. Okay, so let's go back to what we were planning to do in regards to this podcast and what you more or less started with. And I would say that it's very interesting that you said that your company moved and transformed into more or less story. You approached it first from the design perspective, and then you said, well, wait a minute, I'm spending more time on the stories with our customers. Uh, we actually experienced the same. It's funny that we were called a presentation design agency. And then our after our first project with Deutsche Telekom, we became mm. presentation agency. Really? Because okay, that's the design was not the problem. Like it needed to be improved, but the problem was the story. Yeah. And you are super, like you are very much into stories and in, into storytelling. People who are listening to this podcast are business professionals, obviously some designers, of course, but what should they know about story and storytelling? It's, it's interesting that we've been, both been on that same journey because you're absolutely right. And, um, and I can't, profess to have, have been clever enough at the start of the whole process to go it's all about story uh, so I was pulled in just like you we by by companies saying um, <clears throat> we've got we've got a problem uh, and, and if I can tell you a very quick story <laughs> to explain the, the power of story um, I won't name their names but it's actually in the book as, as, a, as a sort of a case study many many years ago I mean I don't think I'd even start officially started the business it was kind of a, a, a paid hobby uh, and I had a really awful looking website and uh, I was amazed one day I got a phone call uh, through the website and it was a really large hotel chain uh, huge global hotel chain and um, and uh, I had had the brief conversation with them and they said, look, we've got, a, we've got our presentation, our agency's worked on it um, and uh, we're still not happy. You're the expert, have a look at it and tell us, you know, sort of what you, what you would change. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. Just email it over and uh, I'll have a look at this a little bit. We can't email it over, it's, it's too big. We'll get it biked over to your studio. Well, at this point, I, I didn't have a studio. I had my back bedroom. so. I, 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 I called my wife. I said, there'll be a bike courier turning up at home in the next half hour. Can you look businesslike when you answer the phone? Uh, when you answer the door? Uh, why, the, why the courier? Mind, I've no idea. But anyway, I, get, I, I finally get back home from my paid job and the, the package is waiting for me there. And I open this, this CD-ROM. It's so long ago. Yeah. CD-ROM up. And this thing was a, it was a work of art. The packaging was beautiful. I put the, the CD in and the screen lit up and it was just the most glorious looking presentation you've ever seen. Look, uh, transitions were out of this world. Everything looked great. And my wife was looking over my shoulder. She went, wow, that looks beautiful. You've never done anything that looks that good. Oh, well, thank you, dear. Uh, so <laughs> this is really going well. I'm thinking, okay, I've got nothing I can add here. And then I took a step back and I looked at the presentation and it was all about them. It was all about, uh, yeah, the first five slides, I kid you not, were pictures of their executive board. Beautifully right. shot pictures and they looked lovely on screen, but they were, it was all about, this is how great we are. This is how big we are. Look at all of the hotels we have all over the world. So it was then I went, ah, okay, looks fantastic. I can't add anything in terms of look and feel, but this story is awful. And so I prepared for the, for the meeting and I went along and I thought I was just meeting with the marketing director um, and it was going to be a cozy conversation over, over a coffee. And I, I got to the big reception and <laughs> they said, uh, and uh, he popped out, lovely man. And he said, Simon, thanks very much. Um, the other guys are just finishing up and then you're on. I said, what? He said, you're, you're going to present back your thoughts and ideas to, to the team. I was like, okay. Well, my first point was lose the pictures of the middle-aged guys at the start of the, of the presentation. They need to be pushed mm. towards the back. So I walk into this room and they're, they're, they're in like a horseshoe. There are about 20 of them. 
And I recognize all of them because those are the guys that were the, the pictures in the, in the presentation. And I thought, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, which is, is an English saying of going, you know, might as well just go for it. I said, um, and they said, if you could set up and show us your, your artwork, that would be great. I didn't have any artwork to share. So I just said, look, I think your biggest problem has nothing to do with design. It's all to do with story. Silence. I said, for example, the first five slides, four or five slides of your presentation are pictures of you guys. Now, don't get me wrong. It's important they know that they're dealing with serious people, but don't lead with that. Silence. And I, just, and I thought, okay, I'm just digging a hole here. So I'll just keep digging. And about five minutes in, the biggest, scariest guy right in the middle, obviously the, the big boss, slammed down his fist. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is when I get thrown out. <laughs> and he said, thank, and I won't repeat the language. He said, thank goodness for that. Finally, somebody has figured out what's wrong with this presentation. He said, I've sat through three meetings today where people have talked about what they can do with our, you know, our branding and, and what have you. He said, none of that makes a difference unless we have a great story. You've nailed it. When can you start? And I didn't show a single slide. Thank goodness, because I wouldn't have got the job if I had, because my, mm. my, my own designs were awful. But the power of somebody going, that's it. We can look the most beautiful piece of work, but if all they remember is how pretty the slides were, but not how powerful the story was or what the key message was, then you've got a problem. Yeah. That more or less explains absolutely everything in it, regards it was, to my question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was a scary process to go through. I wouldn't want to do it now. I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah. I came out of that meeting sweating and, and went for a lie down. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we had a very interesting, not, it was not like your case, but we got invited to speak with, and that is more, maybe let's jump quickly to your session because when I approached you guys and more or less, I approached you for the conference, I said, Hey, like we have this, these sessions, right? We have Kendall heaven, who is going to speak on storytelling. We have David, who is also going to cover story, but from another point of view, however, uh, we're missing this session that I believe was incredibly important. And you agreed immediately to, to do that one, which is, Hey, how do you take the audience in mind and tailor the presentation based on that audience? Um, before I ask you, like, what should people expect in your session? I just want to emphasize something that I believe, I don't know, let me know if you have seen something similar, but I think people should understand it very, like they should really hear that out because we were in, you know, how people joke when they talk about the C-level executives and how they are like, what are they doing? Like, what are they doing on a daily basis? Yeah. Like these guys don't understand anything. They're not doing the work. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you have that in the UK also. Oh, right? absolutely. So that's an international thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we got invited uh, to work with, not invited, but we were working with this customer from a long, long time. And then we got um, asked to get into a meeting and we were about to discuss the story of a presentation. But when we enter the meeting, so when you enter the, when you enter the, their building, there is a reception. And when you enter in the reception, if you are for the sixth floor, that means that you're going to meet the executives, right? <laughs> okay. so, so I'm like, we go in the sixth floor, obviously on and on, and we enter into a room. And in that room, there is the CEO of the company, which is a very big financial institute, bank like bank, banking institution here, um, and the CCO, the chief commercial officer. And that CCO, that guy, is data-driven like you cannot imagine. Like he can look at tons of data and he can get you the insights. And the insights are so precious. Like they are so on point that once I left that meeting, by the way, because it was the first time I saw, it, saw him, I was like, Jesus, this guy is <laughs> incredible. Like, what's going on in here? Who are those people? <laughs> like, yeah, where are we talking Google? Yeah. yeah like, where do, like, where do they find them? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, of course, for our industry, that's like, we don't need that. But I, 
And we entered there and uh, the CEO asked us, say, can you wait for a second? So they were writing on the board, on the whiteboard. And that is the going to your, uh, to your session. But I just want to emphasize it because the CEO, and again, this CCO guy is super data, super logic, all of those things. And so he wrote a lot of things on the whiteboard and the CEO asked him one very simple question. I won't name names, as you said, mm -hmm. because it's not correct, not, not, not right. But he said, hey, whatever his name is, how is what you written on that whiteboard correct and right and needed when you know who is going to consume this presentation? Yeah. Right? That question coming from the CEO of the company has to tell you how much on a fundamental level he understands what presentations are all about, right? How is this helping us when you know who is going to read this document? In that, in that case, it was a document that was going to be sent over email. But yeah. that question and that focus to the, to the audience was, I was like, okay, this is you. why he is the CEO. Right? <laughs> that, that is the reason why he's the CEO. So you accepted to talk about kind of crafting the story based on the audience. There was a little bit about like, what should people expect at your session? Because Absolutely. it's on the second day of the conference on the 16th of April. So the, um, the big thing for us has been for, for a long time, but it really was sort of uh, galvanized it, it sort of across the business when I wrote the book is make, ensuring that the pre presentation, every presentation, is focused on the audience. A phrase we use a lot is the audience is the most important stakeholder in any presentation. And the example I will use, <laughs> again, another story, and I hope these are helpful, is we were coaching a, um, we, we were asked to coach a very senior guy in a very large organization. And um, it, was, it, it was done very, very nicely, but basically one of his, his, his team said, the guy just dies on stage and we need your help. So it was on our training arm and supporting him. And we said, well, let's, let's see him in action uh, because he had a, a, a sort of a, a, a speaking slot at a conference a couple of days yeah, ahead. So we went along and we watched him present and he, did, he wasn't good. And he wasn't good for lots of reasons. A story was a major issue, um, but there were a lot of other things. And the, the, I knew that we had our work cut out and it was a really interesting project and it, it's been a real success, but we had, we, I knew we had our work cut out when he got off stage and I said, so how do you think that went? And he went, well, I thought, and I won't lie. I thought I was brilliant. Problem was the audience weren't with me. It was like, oh, okay. That's your problem because that's a presenter that's thinking about themselves and how good they look, how slick they present, what they do with their hands and all of those sort of things, and have completely forgotten the most important stakeholder, which is the audience. If your audience leaves with information that's valuable, if the audience leaves with a message that they can remember and ultimately then share with their own colleagues and friends, that's a powerful presentation. Yeah, one of the things we talk about a lot is uh, what we call outcome-based presenting, which is you have to get yourself in the mindset of if you're going to present, if you're going to take an hour, half an hour of somebody's time, you have to ensure that you give them something of value that they can act upon at the end of this. Every presentation is a transaction. I don't care if it's an internal presentation, obviously if it's a sales presentation or a pitch presentation, they are very obviously transactional, but every presentation is a transaction between the presenter and the audience. And you've got to get under the skin of your audience, you know, walk a mile in their shoes and understand them before you even start crafting your presentation. So we have a process called audience heat mapping, which is a really simple back of an envelope approach just to prompt people to think a little deeper about their audience. And we, we talk through where we ask a series of questions and you can then plot them against three different axes to say, oh, OK, that's a very factual audience or that's a visionary or an emotional audience or a, you know, so that there are certain outliers. And that's one of the things that we'll go through in, in the session that we've got in April is to make sure that people have this very quick 
way of just asking themselves the question about their audience. Because unless you ask yourself the question, you are just going to, um, you're just going to, you're like a recording. There's no, there's no connection. And um, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know if this, this analogy works, but it's like when we used to be able to go to concerts, rock concerts and what have you, if the band on stage plays every song perfectly, but doesn't interact, it's kind of a boring gig. But when you go and there's interaction between the audience, they're doing things that are slightly differently, you feel like you're part of something, you're, you're part of that experience. And, um, and that's what we need to do. An audience needs to leave excited or exhilarated or, or moved by what they've heard. And for me, that's why doing, the, doing the, the hard work on paper first, before you even start thinking about design, is a really important part of a proper presentation process. Yeah, I think that like that is so much true. We always push, especially, especially for the important moments, we always push our customers to say, hey, forget about PowerPoint, forget about Apple Keynote or Prezi or beautiful AI or whatever you may be using. Like that's not the point. The design is just supporting the message, right? And exactly. it comes after you clarify that message. And in order for you to clarify it, you need to understand who is going to consume it kind of. Yeah. Right? yeah. And without you understanding that, <laughs> you have a major- It ain't gonna happen. Yeah, absolutely. You have a major, major problem. So that being said, we can maybe, we were talking with you and discussing that are all of that being said, like, can we say that all presentations are persuasive or could be persuasive? Like what is the state there? Because obviously if you don't know the audience, it may be tricky. Yeah. And, and the thing with audience heat mapping is, um, and this is a caveat that I, I will always share is it's always going to be a best guess. Yeah. Mm. There, there's no, there's no, guarantee they will be exactly as you expect them to be yeah we've all been in meetings where you go okay i know who i'm, I'm presenting to and certainly you yeah, professionals like us will go through the process of developing a presentation that's, that aligns with their requirements yeah we'll have a very clear call to action so that we know what we want them to do afterwards and all of that stuff and all of that preparation is put in place and then as you're setting up or as you're you know, mid-meeting, suddenly the big boss walks in and the, uh, the, the environment changes completely. Yeah, that climate within the room suddenly changes and people suddenly tense up a little bit sometimes, or depending on the culture of the business. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you have to be adept at responding to that. Um, one of the challenges we face, yeah, like it or not, is that when we're presenting remotely, it's not as easy to read the room. Uh, certainly when people turn their cameras off, you don't necessarily know who's in the room, but they, you could, so there are certain things that you need to do differently because we're presenting more remotely these days. Um, but a lot of those human, uh, factors that, that good presenters innately have, you know, that can read a room and go, okay, I, yeah, if I, if I try and be too jolly and too sort of flippant, I'm, this isn't going to, this is not the time for that. And sometimes you have to do that to get a bit of energy in the room and, and you naturally read that. Um, we need to be a little bit smarter about doing that remotely, but it's all going back to the fundamental of, it's all about your audience. Audience is the most important stakeholder. Then let's develop a presentation that can drive an action from that audience. Um, and you sorry to back, back to your sort of initial question, which is, are all presentations persuasive? I think they are. Because otherwise, if, if, you're, if all you're doing is sharing information, then is a presentation the right forum to do that? And the example I would give you is we work with um, a lot of the big tech companies here in the UK. And one of, one of the, the, the clients we work with every quarter, we work with them on their town hall internal comms presentation. When we first started working with them, they did the standard of, well, we know what we want to say. Here are the slides. Can you make them look a bit nicer, please? And we started the process of saying, look, you're gathering this particular organization, thousands of people together remotely now, but previously it was, you know, sort of they, they were doing big old town halls. And 
if you're going to do that, it's costing you and your business, just in basic terms, a vast amount of money. You're taking everybody out of the out of the loop for an hour. What's that costing you? Plus, it's the interruption. It's it, there's everything going on here, <clears throat> and if you don't provide value through those town halls, then you have an even bigger problem. And that bigger problem is is that people will get bored of them. They won't see the value in them. So if you create a more persuasive presentation, even if you're talking about let's let's talk about something really mundane, <clears throat> like COVID, uh, yeah, sort of COVID precautions in office buildings not the most exciting thing in the world if you just present that as a set of facts people will listen and forget if you talk to them in a more persuasive way they're saying look if we do this in this way this allows those people that have been frustrated at having to work from home gives them the opportunity to do this you you make it you put forward the case for it you make it a more persuasive compelling reason to listen so now, rather than just saying, when you go to the office, make sure that you keep two meters apart from each other and wear a mask when you stand up, suddenly those instructions are shrouded with, this is why we should be doing these things. And that's the persuasive element. And if you lose sight of that because you just turn into an information source, you've got to accept if that's what you're going to do, 80% yeah, of what you share will be forgotten within the hour. The other 20% forget it. By the end of the day, it was just something in the diary. Nothing has changed. And you've got to look to move that needle and connect with your audience and go in full circle. You can only do that if you think about your audience properly. What is it about them that they're, why have they turned up? Why are they going to bother listening to you? Basic question, but that's, that's the sort of thing we need to get into. Yeah, and you mentioned a lot of just multiple times you mentioned virtual 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 that's happening nowadays <clears throat> what are you seeing with your customers what are you seeing with the people that you work with in regards to the way they prepare or in regards to the way they deliver their presentations what are you guys advising them to change because at least from what we are seeing with our clients it's very strange i think yeah. that even not only them but even some otherwise super popular and experienced people still consider that when they're on stage and when they're presenting virtually, it's actually the same. Now, I don't agree com at all <laughs> that it, it is the same. It's like saying that a, a slide deck is the same with a book, right? Yeah. Let's say it's not. It's the same information inside, but you know, the format is different. <laughs> so, uh, so what are you advising people? Or like, if you have to come up with top three things that people need to take in mind nowadays because virtual presentations are here to stay for at least let's say six more months yeah um, absolutely so we've uh, I, I keep throw, throwing these sort of you know these little sort of three letter uh, uh, three word sort of formulas at you and, and one that that we we were working on prior to lockdown and prior to covid but that has actually really gathered pace and, and become yeah become really powerful um, is something called connect communicate sustain so it's a three-stage process, and this is really what we see a lot of presentations should be going through. And so that was that was sort of our message way back. But since we're presenting more remotely, it's become ever more important. So the connect phase is kind of what we were talking about before, which is who's your audience? Yeah, you've got to do the, the homework before you move to the communicate phase. So how are you going to connect with your audience? What, what are the hot topics for them? Why are they listening to you? Um, and what story structure, because there are lots of different story structures that we can pull upon, which one is going to be most appropriate for them, but also to do, ensure that you get what you want out of the presentation. So connect is, is kind of an, an offline process. Communicate is, uh, is that piece where you actually communicate with your audience, that, that remote presentation. And the changes that we're seeing there, thankfully, are more presentations are becoming shorter. Mm. Hallelujah. Fantastic news. <laughs> yeah, nobody ever complained about a presentation being too short. We've heard that many, many times from lots of different people. It's still the case. And with remote presentations, if you recognize that you've got three phases of a presentation now, this allows you to make that communicate phase really valuable. 
because the sustain phase is the follow-up. <clears throat> this is where I think we, we, a lot of people are now starting to see the light and recognize, oh, okay, this is why this stuff works. So if you take communicate as your 15, 20 minute remote presentation, you've prepared that really carefully, the, the, the information that you share, the slides maybe you've developed for that presentation should be really valuable. The bad worst practice is that people go, okay, thank you very much for that. I'll send you the slides after the meeting. Don't do that. Sustain that third phase of that process is actually going, okay, how do I now repurpose that content into a format that actually not only reinforces my message to the people that attended the meeting, but it can also be a really valuable tool for the people that were not able to make the meeting. Mm. Zoom and Teams is great. We can record our, our presentation. So I wouldn't suggest for one moment, if you couldn't make the meeting, you're, you're the big boss and I'm saying he couldn't make the meeting. So I'm gonna send him all 20 minutes of the presentation on video, edit, using Windows, using Mac, whatever it is. I mean, they all have video editing software inbuilt now. Um, edit down to the last, yeah, the key five minutes that are gonna be relevant to that particular person. So that audience member, again, audience centric content. But we can also be looking at how do we repurpose the document, uh, the, the presentation into a document, maybe into an interactive HTML5 document. Is there, are there GIFs that can, you, can be used even to, to sort of uh, reinforce the message through internal social media like Yammer or what have you? There are so many different ways that you can repurpose that core content you created to sustain your message after the meeting. And that sustained bit is forgotten, uh, has been forgotten for a long, long time. Um, it's more important than ever now as people are being bombarded with Zoom meetings and Zoom calls to make sure that your message continues to live on after that half hour meeting that you had. Yeah, that's that's an interesting take on it. Like that sustained part, I think that many people in the business world just complain about it and say, yeah, but I don't have the time to do that. Um, oh, okay, but it's cool, I need slides, but I understand that slides should be very simple, but then when I send them, uh, they're useless, which they should be. They should right? be, absolutely. Uh, which yeah. they should be, but then you have to do the document or or slide doc or slide document in our industry, depending on who, which literature or books you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carl Nancy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it depends, exactly. Yeah. Or then what you said about this, editing of the video and all of those things it's just many people and i think we were talking with no one from no one hymns creative yeah, uh, no one who that. also i thought i think that i saw that you were on their podcast yes that that's right on the presentation podcast by the way uh, shout out to the presentation podcast if someone who is listening to this one does not know yet for the presentation podcast and you care about presentations that is yet another incredible a super valuable resource where you can find a ton of knowledge and wisdom. Um, you also have podcast. Uh, yeah, well, we've got a, a, a we've got a series of what we call in conversation videos. We you, you and I are doing one in a few weeks' time. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, so yeah, they, they tend to be more video based. But okay. uh, uh, but okay. yeah, we just and we don't we're not as good at you at sort of regularly planning them we just when we find somebody interesting we jump on a call with them and record it so do you repurpose that in audio format of course we do <laughs> every time <laughs> okay just asking so, <laughs> so so yeah but many people say nowadays and this is what we are also seeing because of this virtual world that you now have to like we always advise hey like invest in microphones invest in like a good camera, all of those things, because it matters, you know, this first impression that you make on those people, like it matters. And then you can hear those, uh, you can hear people. Yeah, but I don't understand those things. Like, I don't understand how to work with microphones or with video cams. And then you say, Hey, you need to edit your videos. And now it turns out that every business professional needs to be a little bit geeky, you know, in yeah. order for them. And, but, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, yeah, we tend to be because of the type of people that we are. We love all of this kit, and that's yeah. that's fine. The, the those people that go, 
I don't have time to produce a follow-up yep. document or it's, yeah, it's not important enough. Well, you know what? It was important enough for you to take half an hour of your audience's time. So it should be important enough for you to follow up properly. Yeah, we, we do a lot of work with sales teams and one of the things that we see, and you, you won't believe this, but I see it time and time again, is that salespeople back in the day you know, when we could uh, do meetings, face-to-face uh, -face meetings, they would get up at five o'clock in the morning to drive 100 miles to go and see a prospect for nine o'clock. They would be there. They would deliver a presentation, hopefully a good presentation. They then would sit on getting that proposal document out for two weeks, by which time the prospect has either made a, a decision with somebody else or forgotten why they really were that interested in the first place. That's the sustained bit. And I see it with presenters. I see it with salespeople. I see it with all form of communicators is don't, don't drop the baton at the last sort of uh, phase of the race. Yeah. Don't trip over that last hurdle. It is about, digging deep and going, it was worth my time two days ago when I presented, it's got to be worth my time now. And if I may, I, because we talked about it on the presentation podcast a, a few weeks ago, um, we we've created an insights book. Uh, we do these insights sort of uh, studies uh, around business efficiency and a biz, uh, or presentation efficiency, beg your pardon. And presentation efficiency isn't about how many slides you can produce in an hour. It's actually the, the re return on investment you get from the time that you put in. You will not get a good return on investment if you go, here's my message, chew on that, and that's it. You've then got to follow it up. And that's why you'll get the deal. That's why you'll get the buy-in from your people. And if people are not serious enough about following it up, question whether you should be presenting at all and i know that sounds very grumpy yeah but you've got to view this as a business process a business transaction um i'll get off my soapbox now but it's yeah, th yeah. this stuff is important yeah i think that our industry gets very emotional about that part with the whole communi the whole communication part especially the presentation part because it's that one-on-one -on -one personal contact with the other side and we just care so much about all of those things. And sometimes we, even I, I would say it for myself, I probably even some, during some trainings, I get too emotional because I care so much about those people. And I'm like, guys, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is hard. No one says that it's easy, but like, there are so many things that we can do here to win this customer over or for you to get that promotion. And you're just saying, I'm busy. Like, I'm also busy. Mm. like everyone is busy nowadays what does that mean like do you care about that or not it's mm. it, it goes back to the fact that and i know we're both very much on the same page on this is the opportunity to present is a huge privilege yeah you are you are by presenting taking something from somebody that they can never get back which is their time if yeah we if i was presenting as i am later on today I'm going to be taking up a half hour of somebody's really busy schedule. I've got to make sure, damn sure, that I give them value. Otherwise, how can I, how can I you know, take it to the nth degree? How can I sleep at night? That guy's get, you know, put, sort of turns off Zoom and goes, well, what? that was a waste of my time. I've now got to work half an hour later this evening because of that wasted time. Not have time with their, their family, their kids, whatever it might be. Really yeah. frustrating. But people don't, people view presentations too often as a task and not as a privilege. And we've got to change that. By the way, the, have you read the book of uh, this guy whose name is Tim Grover? No. Who was, who, uh, it's not in the presentation space. I just, when I'm hearing you saying that, uh, and I, I'm going to try to quote him, uh, Tim Grover, highly recommend everyone uh, to see that book. It's called the. It's called relentless. Um, Tim Grover. I found him because I am. On, let's say I was a Kobe fan. I'm still a Kobe fan, meaning the NBA um, right. superstar Kobe brand. And it turned out that Tim Grover was his personal trainer. But then <laughs> it turned out that Tim Grover is actually the person was the personal trainer of Michael Jordan. Okay, he's got and, form. <laughs> and, and then I was like, okay, if you are the personal trainer of both. 
Jordan and Kobe, you probably know something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're worth just listening probably, to. You probably know something about training and stuff like that, physical training, I mean. Yeah. And then it turns out that he has a book, the, it's called Relentless. And in that book, he talks more or less about their mindset and how they approach the game, how they train, all of that stuff. But he has this more, I'm not sure that I'm going to quote him like exactly, but he says that when somebody gives you a task, when somebody gives you or assigns you a task, it's a privilege to have that task. Yeah. Right. This is this person trusting you and giving you the opportunity to execute because he or she trusts you and gives you like that is just when i read this i was like oh my god that is so goddamn right on a daily basis when you work with people that you manage even though it, no matter whether or not you are the team lead the team manager the vice like if you have any team like just thinking in that way and making the people around you think in this way, it may completely change the way everything happens yeah. in, a, in an organization. But very few people approach it this way, I think. And that is, yeah, that is why well, we it, and, and get it emotional shows. sometimes. Yeah, it shows. That's the thing. When people don't yeah. take it seriously, when they phone in, you know, one of the things that we get frustrated by, you haven't seen it too much recently, but uh, half past nine in a, uh, on a weekday in any Starbucks or Costa Coffee in the UK, uh, yeah, around the world, there will be legions of salespeople making changes to their presentation before their 10 o'clock meeting. Well, that's yeah, not that's preparation. That's, that's not the understanding the privilege of presenting. Yeah. Yeah. The opportunity working so hard spending so much time and money to get the opportunities to present and then you, you you don't get your act together uh because you you can't be bothered you don't recognize the privilege that's that's frustrating yeah that's that's super like i get super angry when that happens like even with some of our customers when this this happened before and they're like uh, you know we got invited to speak in this place or that place so can you help us? And I'm like, when are you speaking there? <laughs> oh, well, we need to travel to Germany tomorrow because the conference is two days from now. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Yeah. How long have you known about this? Like, what are you guys talking about? Like, you said that this is the best event, the best conference in Europe for your industry. And you are now talking about and thinking about starting to this like, you're now coming up with the thought that you may need to do something about that. Like, what is this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually worked with, we worked with SAP mm -hmm. in Germany and we worked with, they have this uh, program, which is called SAP IO, which is uh, for startups. And these guys, as you can imagine, before they, uh, after the program, they have this so-called demo day. Right. When yeah. SAP, as you can imagine, SAP has a ton of customers. Let's just put it this way. Um, yeah. And they, they know everybody. <laughs> they know absolutely everybody. And the people who run the program, especially in Berlin, are incredible. Like kudos to those guys. I know them. Uh, some of them, I can say, it's a very close people. Um, and they invite in the audience some of the most influential people in the industry that this I, this program is all about because they do it. For example, they take one season and they do, let's say, big data. Okay. Then the other season is healthcare or stuff yeah. like that. And they invite the most influential people in the industry to be in the audience. And then those guys, those six, seven or eight teams get the opportunity to present in front of those people for five minutes. I'm like, if I was on your plate, that was a discussion because uh, we had this like up until late night before the the event they're still fixing their presentations mm -hmm. i'm like guys i will just tell you something if i had the opportunity to present in front of those people i would do everything i can to take your spot yeah no and i'll tell you why i'll do everything i can to take your spot because there is no other way or show me how are you going to do that there is no other way in the upcoming future for you to get everyone that you need focused on you in one room at the same time there is no way no like 
how are you going to get the VPs or the C-level executives of Volkswagen, Mercedes, <laughs> Porsche, um, uh, uh, Audi, and all of those brands in one place, in one room, at the same time, focused at you? Like, how are you going to do that? Yeah. And you're still, like, you're still not caring? Like, what? Yeah, and- really? That's the thing. And it's, and I think it's a cultural thing. I think there's, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm aware that we, we could be, we could be turning into grumpy old men or, or I'm certainly grumpy and old. You're, you're, you're just grumpy. <laughs> uh, and, but, um, but I think part of it is that thing, tools like PowerPoint and Keynote and Prezi are too easy to use mm. and people end up viewing those as the presentation, not the information that's being shared. Yeah. And and I think there's a, a really important fl- yeah, so switch that needs to be flicked that allows people to kind of go, I get it. It's not how great did my styles look. That is important. Don't get me wrong. But really the measure of this presentation is what change did I prompt in the audience? Use that as the measure. How much do they remember and act upon? Yeah, if they if they leave the auditorium from the SAPIO sort of a showcase and going, wow, those guys, th- th- that guy had great slides, but you can't remember any of the content. It was a failure. Yeah. Apart from the great designer who works on some very attractive looking slides, the story wasn't strong enough. The connection between the presenter and the audience wasn't strong enough. And that's the stuff that needs to be worked upon. Yeah. Simon, we can talk about a lot of things, obviously, for hours and hours and hours. However, <laughs> I, I, we are not going to go to the book, uh, obviously, right now. Uh, we are not going to get in detail uh, for and talk about and discuss the story structures which we were planning to do however that means that we can just do another episode which is all There's about good writing books which are more or less stories and there we can in kind of incorporate all of that in regards to publishing and all of that stuff however i have two quick ones to kind of summarize Great. and kind of finalize and wrap up the episode first of all uh, first the first one is a uh, a little bit strange maybe uh, we always ask not always i'm lying I'm, it's not always it's since recently uh, <laughs> we're asking people if you know somebody in who cares about presentations be that business person be that someone from our industry or whoever for some reason somebody made an impression on you related to something about presentations that we need to get on the podcast who would that person be Ooh. like do you have somebody that's a very good question uh, ba, 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 ba. off the top of my head i i don't yeah. know how open they are to, to doing podcasts and i, I <laughs> it's awful because i can't quite remember the chap's name now but uh but i i'll again i'll tell a very quick story i was i was uh, i was fortunate enough to be part of a, a big sort of marketing uh events and it was a strange old event i don't know if they do this outside of the uk but what these companies will do is they will get marketing leaders uh onto a cruise ship and then they will for two days and basically you take you know these these guys get on for free and then there are sponsors that that stand you know sort of uh that that use it as an opportunity to pitch to these marketing people well i it was very early on in my my career at Eiffel we had no budget so I didn't do any of that but I was asked to go along and do some coaching sessions with with presenters marketing guys and um, so I went on this trip for free which was really interesting really interesting sort of process there was a guy presenting uh, who um, everybody else had big screen presentations there was one guy that was doing really interesting things with fragrance as a presentation tool so he was going into the into the audience and spraying a fragrance going what does that make you feel really sort of wild ideas but there was one guy that came on and on stage was a, an overhead projector you know the old style overhead projector with a bunch of pens and some acetates and just a chair next to it and he came on and he spoke for 45 minutes just using the visuals of him drawing as he was telling this story and it being beamed onto the big screen. It was remarkable how powerful that was. And he kind of broke every current rule. He sat down the entire time. He was, his voice wasn't the most engaging voice. He was a kind of a grumpy, mm. overweight guy. Uh, but he was t- he he had a story that was really well told all the way through, 
and then um, and then his visuals were really sparse but really powerful, and he drew them in real time. And they weren't pretty. They were. There wasn't a work of art. They were just boxes or squares or Venn diagrams that helped him tell that part of the story. And I was like, wow, that's that's pre that's pure presenting, and uh, I loved it. And so uh, I will attempt to go through my notes and remember his name. You need to find the name of that person. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But he was great and amazing how powerful he was in terms of telling that story. Brilliant. Okay, let's try to find this person. That is interesting. There are always ex exceptions to the rules, I think. So yeah, I can imagine. So last one, what is the best way for people to connect with you and the agency? Like, how are we doing this? Right. Uh, social media. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, so just search for Simon Morton Eiffel and hopefully I'll pop up. Um, Twitter, uh, Eiffel Prez. So E-Y-E-F-U-L Prez. Uh, and our website, uh, Eiffel Presentations, all one word, dot com. And that's E-Y-E-F-U-L. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find us and uh, we'd love to chat because we, as you can probably tell, we're a passionate lot when it comes to presentations and, uh, and we love to, to help people make the change. Yeah. And we'll make sure that we link those up together with the book, right? Great. Right. Thank I'll you. Find the link and I'll put that uh, link also in the book. So Simon, thanks a lot for taking the time. It was a pleasure. A one hour, almost one hour passed by very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it really has, hasn't it? Thank you. Yeah. So thanks for stay, uh, Thanks for taking the time. And again, just huge thanks for, accepting the invite for the conference i'm really looking forward to the whole event and to your session i'll be the moderator and helping out during your session Wonderful. so i think we'll be we'll have quite some fun <laughs> as i like to say we have a lot of fun during that one also so thanks everyone for listening we will link up absolutely everything that simon mentioned his cha the channels that he's on the website the book absolutely everything also you'll find the links to the conference it's called present to succeed in the show notes if you are still not coming to that event you should be or you must <laughs> join us in april for sure so take a look at the no show notes hopefully that was useful and if you want to know more obviously about who we are we are 356 laps not 365 laps simon a lot of people say we're 365 so i have fallen into that trap myself really was yes that the i case? have i'm sorry <laughs> okay so we're 356 laps uh, you can check us out also on 356lab.com. Thanks again for listening and see you in the next one.